Yeah, so welcome everyone uh, to the panel on artificial intelligence and in, uh, education. And our panel today will be really looking ahead at uh, what they are seeing, what they're paying attention to, and um, what they they see in the future of AI, as, especially for um, education. So uh, thank you very much for joining us panelists. I would like you, each of you to introduce yourselves and also provide a little bit about how you think AI will influence the future of higher education. So Anne, I see you at the top of my screen first, if you wanna get started. Sure, happy to. Uh, so I'm Ann Zoranin and I am an accounting faculty member. And um, so I'm of the panelists, I'm, I'm kind of the rookie here on, on AI. I was recently involved in a very large crowdsourced research project, which in and of itself was fun. Uh, 328 co-authors on a paper testing um, the use of AI to answer accounting questions. So um, I teach data analytics um, in accounting. And one of the things that we focus on in the analytics class is critical thinking. And I think that uh, the use of AI and the ability, I should say, of AI for students to have access to really, really emphasizes how important teaching students to think critically is. Uh, because not everything that they're going to get out of AI is going to be accurate, and they really have to become educated users of the technology. Thank you. Uh, David, why don't you go next, and then you can sort of call on maybe who you think should go afterwards. Oh, now you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm David Gunkel, Professor of Media Studies in Department of Communication. Uh, on the research side, I mainly concentrate on the ethics and law of emerging technology. And I've written six books on AI and ethics um, over the last uh, decade or so. On the uh, education side and interacting with students, I'm really working to bring AI into the humanities and the social sciences curriculum, specifically in uh, our discipline of communication, um, and have done a number of books on um, making artificial intelligence accessible to students who are non-STEM uh, fields and trying to get them engaging with the technology. I think we are looking at a time right now when we have to integrate AI across the curriculum. There is no field that will not be touched by these innovations and developing uh, strategies for bringing this technology into our various disciplines and engaging our students in critical engagement, I think is uh, really our job as educators. So I will turn it over to my colleague, Andrea Guzman, because she comes after me alphabetically. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm Andrea Guzman. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication. I'm over on the journalism side uh, in the Department of Communication. Um, my area of research focuses on human machine communication and how people conceptualize of artificial intelligence or what we call compute communicative AI, um, such as Siri, Alexa, as well as now ChatGBT. Um, as a communicative other. I also um, study and teach about the integration of artificial intelligence into media industries. Um, I've been teaching AI to students or about AI uh, to students since uh, before I came to NIU. Um, and so I've been teaching it here at NIU though for about uh, eight years um, and also teaching other educators um, through professional organizations about how to talk with their students um, and approach AI in the classroom. I am the lead editor of the forthcoming Human Machine Communication Handbook, which looks at how AI and robotics are affecting multiple fields, uh, everything from healthcare to space flight to engineering to commerce to business. Um, and I also uh, serve on a board, a media advisory board for the Institute of Public Relations, which is one of the largest professional institutions for public relations. And in that capacity, I uh, work with and hear from practitioners uh, and how they are integrating these technologies um, into their spaces. Uh, like my colleagues have also indicated, um, you know, teaching about AI is 
is necessary. Um, the approaches to how we teach about AI, though, will, of course, vary across discipline, although I think there's some central tenets that we'll talk about today um, that we need to be uh, thinking about. But I also want to talk about uh, the fact that teaching about AI does not have to be scary. Um, and uh, there's really good ways to positively approach it, even if uh, we're just learning about it ourselves. So thank you. And I'll um, next go on to uh, Miao Sun. Uh, and I know he does some excellent research on trust in uh, AI, so. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. And like, hello, everyone. Like, uh, I'm Miao Sun, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. And my research focus is a human computer action and the vision analytics. And I, I, I teach like a human computer action, teach vision analytics. And also I teach like uh, programming language courses in the department. And I, I think like AI is a very important part. So definitely my course touch like the fundamental principles that in the AI stuff. But also the tricky thing is things the rise of chat GPT and suddenly one day it all challenge all the computer science homework assignments because the student can simply post the like questions in chat GPT. They can write a, a diverse like a version of the codes. And even like we cannot recognize the thing is actually written by the student or somehow generated by the tool. And, but unfortunately that's like what happens now. And I think that will be the trends during the past few years or even longer. So instead of trying to blocking it, and I may also think it's almost impossible for us to blocking students using it. And we have to think about a better way to help the student actually kind of like a live with it and smartly use it. And that somehow may also kind of like revolutionize the whole like CS education. Yep, this is like my current understanding and thanks. Thank you. Uh, we also have another panelist, um, Mona Rahimi, but um, I don't see them in the participants panel yet. Um, so that's okay. Um, we'll hope to have them join us soon, but I wanna just go over a little bit about how the panel will work. Um, basically, um, there are some questions that I have that I can kind of pepper in, but please feel free to add your own questions. Um, we do have um, quite a few people in the session, so at least for this point, I'm going to say add your questions to the text chat area, and I will let the panelists know. Um, if, if there's an opportunity and it makes sense, um, you can certainly turn your microphone on as well. Uh, so just to sort of get things going, um, what I'm interested in is this new term I'm hearing, um, artificial literacy. It's sort of the, the new form, maybe new to me, of digital literacy education. Um, do you think that students will need to understand uh, this form of digital literacy, um, such as the mechanical nature of it, the biases, and of course the error patterns that might um, come into play. I think I'll I'll, I'll start um, just from the perspective again. So I'm, I'm a faculty member in the accounting department in the College of Business and. So we've been working with our students, particularly in accountancy on, you know, data literacy, right? Um, and digital literacy, because quite honestly, it's just being used so much in the accounting profession, they really have to understand it. And so kind of piggybacking on what I said in my, in my introduction, um, I really do think it's important that students in all areas, right? Understand what artificial intelligence is, what it can and cannot do, so that they can evaluate, critically evaluate the information that comes out of it. Um, you know, it's kind of, to so many people, it's kind of this black box and, you know, it, it's a really dangerous thing if they don't understand the limitations of it. So I would say, especially understand the limitations, even if they don't understand the computer programming behind it. Yeah, and I, um, 
will uh, kind of expand on what Anne's saying here. So yes, um, I think it's important to think about we're at the beginning of, you know, a new kind of, you know, technological phase. And I like to liken it to the introduction of the internet and the World Wide Web um, in terms of, you know, some of the historical patterns we're seeing in how people react, as well as how uh, these technologies will fundamentally change and have already fundamentally changed in, in some instances, um, how industries and learning will work. So when we're asking that kind of question, the way I hear that question is, would be the equivalent of back in like 1997 when I was first in college, uh, should we you know, teach students the internet, right? And so, so yes, uh, we do need to be talking about artificial intelligence. Um, and what that literacy will look like, I think we can identify some central tenets um, as Anne talked about, as you've talked about, talking about ethics and bias, understanding what it is, um, although that can be kind of a difficult question to answer sometimes, um, and its limitations. Um, and then also thinking about, uh, more importantly, when we're doing this, and I can expand upon this later, is what do students already know about AI or think they know about AI? Um, because there's a lot of gaps there as well. Uh, so yes, this is uh, definitely a form of technology they need to understand, um, but there has to be some thought put into how we approach it next. I will just echo everything that has been said so far and say that when I came to NIU um, 25 years ago, I was hired to teach digital literacy. I pivoted to teaching AI literacy somewhere around 2010 or so. And I will say that when students encounter technology that they don't understand, the technological object is like magic. They type an incantation and it does something and they don't know why it does it. And our job as educators is de to demystify the technology. And that is pop the hood on the black box, let them see inside so that they understand enough of the technology to understand how it impacts their world, their discipline that they are studying, and their future possible careers. Yeah, yeah, like I just agree. But uh, I think this is also like a bit tricky parts about the AI, especially about the application side. And a lot of like the tech company want to like somehow wrap up the, the technical things on the top of it, like by adding some like usable stuff, easy to use, and they always claim like they want to benefit a diverse group of like people, even though they don't have that like a heavy mass or statistical background about it. But I think like it's very important for the student at least to understand the technology is not everything. It still have its like disadvantages. It can potentially have, like have biases. But, and, and, and of course, like depending on the domains or the background of the major of the student, definitely like computer science students, engineering students, they may like want to, or they may have to touch more technical side. They must understand like the mass details and the, the training process, the whole like, like computational like stuff. But for the other majors, like I, I'm sure like learn how to use is very important. But it be beyond just to learn how to use it, it was important for them, or at least the instructor, to teach them to, to introduce them. Those algorithm or, or, or black box is not always one hundred percent correct. You cannot always simply say I, I purely trust them, just to like let my like skills goes away. I think the analogy would be very similar to the situation like a calculator shows up. So does the student still need to learn the math to do the calculation? I think the answer is definitely yes. They need such kind of like capability of doing such kind of things. But but anyway, the tool is there. If they learn the things, if they want to use it, yeah, sure, go ahead. But without the tools, like we'd better want to make sure the student can do it, right? So, yeah. Thank you. Um, excellent, excellent thoughts on that. And one of the things that it, it makes me think about is, you know, it seems like this is something that students from all disciplines need to understand. Uh, I, I think it was Andrea said, you know, maybe not the 
all the mechanics, but they need to understand um, how it affects them and and how they can use it um, in a in maybe a the manner that's appropriate to their discipline. Um, so, do you think that AI is going to be part of students' future careers, or how? I guess the the answer to that may be yes, but you know, how is it going to be important to their future careers? Yeah, I'll I'll start with that, and it's not their future careers; it's their careers now. Um, in fact, in a lot of these, uh, and again, this is discipline dependent, but it's part of been part of journalism careers now for five to 10 years, depending on where you're working. Um, and I think we, you know, the same can be said for uh, various industries. Um, and I, I, I want to also add something here. It's not just about career preparation. This is about helping students understand the world and society. Uh, so I taught an honors class on AI and media across uh, the university. And the reason why that's important is because the news that a lot of people are consuming now is shaped in some way by artificial intelligence. Um, some reports people are receiving are written by artificial intelligence. Um, a big concern around chat GPT is how it can possibly ramp up misinformation and disinformation. So I think there's several ways to think about this going back to the literacy question, right? There's the discipline and industry specific questions about AI that, that we need to address. But then there's an artificial intelligence and social component uh, and political component and democratic component. Just, you know, as we talked about, as we've seen social media, right? People use social media maybe in their careers um, or to build their careers like through LinkedIn, but we've also seen how it has, you know, had implications for the political sphere, right? And how people, in their personal lives and part being part of a, a democratic system need to understand this. We need to think about artificial intelligence, not only within our disciplines and our careers, but at a very, at a larger societal level. The way that I explain this to my students is we are not looking at a future robot invasion. We are living through the robot invasion right now. And if we expect it to look like science fiction with this dramatic uprising or the robots descending from the heavens with ray guns and everything else, we're looking in the wrong place. It's gonna be more like the fall of Rome where we invite these things into our world to take over various roles in our social reality. And slowly but surely more and more AI will be embedded in our everyday activities, it already is. And if we aren't keeping our eye on how this incursion is taking place, where the changes are happening and what it all means for us, we're not educating our students to be resilient as they graduate and step into their careers and take on their first jobs. And I think our job is to really help them be attentive and help them see where these changes are happening and what they can do now to begin pre preparing themselves to not only understand their reality that they live in, but also the future possibilities that they're gonna face after graduation. Go ahead, Nia. You know, like, I, I, I totally agree. Like, like I, I think that the AI and also like a more innovative tools like shows up today potentially kind of like like kind of like a revolutionize the ways like the one how we do the work for example the recently published like i think microsoft just last week released like 365 co-pilot stuff and the whole feature is kind of like changing the the workflow that people starts like working on like uh, like writing articles creating like uh, media type of things well, originally, like people start everything from scratch, they do the things. Well, now, like with like embedded chat GPT type stuff, so all the contents can suddenly be kind of automated and generated by the whole computational side. Then somehow we have to rethink like the roles that people like play in the workflow. Well, I mean, like by at least the Microsoft advertisements, like video stuff, is still the whole process is steering by the people. People initialize the conversation, the content is generated. But would be the other way around? Would be the computational content, computed stuff, well, direct impacts like people's thoughts 
and then the whole workflow would be shift toward the direction that starting by the AI's direction, then like how the student may think about the ways and would they be adapt to such kind of changes? I think it would be important to think about. I really see this as as being a an equity issue. So possibly our populations that are already vulnerable um, is do you see an equity gap widening? So I, I've studied this extensively. Um, I started with the digital divide back in the initial uh, stages of the internet and the web. And there has always been a have and have not divide between the individuals who not only have access to the technology, but have the skills and the opportunity to use it. I think the AI divide and the robot divide, if you want to call it that, is only going to exacerbate already existing social inequities. And part of what our role is as public educators working at a public institution is to try to level the playing field, at least with regards to the students that uh, we serve and the populations uh, that Northern Illinois University has contact with. Um, but obviously, it's a global problem. And getting a handle on this is going to require a lot of initiatives locally, but also thinking globally in the process. Does anyone else have any comments on that? I, ju I just saw some shaking, you know, nodding heads. <laughs> so. I was say, if you think about one of the things that that sparked a, a thought for me when David was talking about, um, you know, robots taking over everything, right? And um, as far as the equity issue, I think that definitely in, in business, we see that a lot of the jobs that are being automated by not only robotics, but also by, you know, AI are the lower level jobs, right? And so I, I think that that does kind of exacerbate that kind of have and have not, right? Um, and, and I, although I don't know what to do about that because it, you know, we can certainly prepare our students at NIU to be the people who don't have their jobs replaced. I don't know as a societal issue, you know, I don't know how to solve that problem. So I think, um, everyone's point and to Anne's point, right, it is a bigger societal issue. And there, we're seeing a lot of analogies with what happened in the first, what was called the first automation crisis in the 60s. Um, and as someone who's grown up around the Rust Belt, um, I, I constantly draw connections uh, in, in working class areas with what happened with industrial automation when robots came onto industrial lines. And we, you know, there's there can be a lot of lessons that we can learn there as well. I think it's important to keep in mind several things here. Um, first on the question more of automation and, and what's gonna be taken over, there's automation, there's augmentation. So there's some ways in which these technologies definitely are very helpful um, and are worked into like human um, workflows in which they assist uh, with, with productivity. Uh, to Anne's point, um, you, you know, yes, where we're seeing some, um, possible job loss. And we actually haven't seen much of it yet in journalism. Currently we're seeing jobs, more jobs opening because you have things like AI editors that you didn't have before. Um, but it would be naive to say that, you know, we're not going to, you know, some jobs may go away and, and some may be, be seen as well. Um, new ones to be seen as well. But there's also this question about internships um, for students. And, you know, some of those lower level jobs that can now be given to AI may have been those entry level positions for students. Um, so that also gets wrapped up in this. And I also want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the fact, you know, going off Dave, David's point, you know, um, there's always these haves and has nots. We also want to think about that in our teaching of AI and, and thinking about the populations we serve here at NIU, because our students already are impacted differently about AI and already um, may have different feelings and thoughts around AI, particularly if they're um, from a community or from a group that's already highly surveilled through something like a facial recognition and teaching um, about these technologies, students will have very different reactions to them. And that's really something we need to think about as educators is that 
there's also going to be differences into how students process and understand these technologies. Um, and, and I want to be clear, some students are scared of these technologies. I've had students outright refuse to interact with a robot in my class. Um, and so we can talk more about that as well. But some of those things do get wound up in these larger social economic issues as well. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask Cindy's question in the text chat, but yeah, that's a that's an interesting interesting path. I guess I never really thought about the the students being being nervous about this, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so Cindy said, I'm teaching a production course this summer on using AI and in instructional technology. So how to use AI tools to design and develop? Are there resources you suggest I provide students, like including ChatGPT, Dali E alike, Avia AI, and ClipChamp? David, I see you've added something into the, the text chat. Um, so it, I, I, am Go right, ahead. I am right now in my AI robots and communication course doing a big unit on computational creativity, which is really addressing these questions. And so we are engaging students and using Dolly, Midjourney, uh, ChatGPT, the GPT Playground, um, some of the music generating uh, algorithms that are out there to create original music. Uh, frankly, right now, you can make an original film using just AI-generated images, AI-generated script, AI-generated voices, and AI-generated music. And knowing um, what this means for those who teach production and for students who are engaged in production activities, I think is going to be crucial for um, getting our students to really understand these tools and what opportunities and what challenges there are for the creative industries as they move forward. Can I ask a clarification question to Cindy? Um, are you looking for more resources in terms of these are the AI technologies I should be teaching? Or are you looking more for resources in terms of is there a larger, more holistic way to teach about AI? You know, are there are there certain resources I should be including about biases in AI? Um, and you may have those already. I'm is this just more of a production question or is this more of a how do I broaden the course question? I'd like to broaden the course. It's a production course. So right. technically it's about them developing something and I will work with them in the tools. But I I have trouble only letting it be a production course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there's um there's a, been a lot of great work done about artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, in terms of the ethical implications, uh, there are some institutes. So AI Now is a great, uh, the AI Now Institute um, has been looking at the integration of artificial intelligence into everyday practices for some time. They put out annual reports that talk about things like biases um, that I use in my classes that are fairly easy for uh, students to understand. Um, there are some and I can send these along later on. There's some uh, newsletters that I've subscribed to uh, by some thought leaders um, in the more of the AI bias camp um, that will constantly kind of provide updated resources on artificial intelligence bias or how to think critically about these technologies um, that are again, accessible to people without technical knowledge. And I think, you know, sometimes, uh, educators, and I certainly felt this way when I was getting into this, you know, if you don't have a computer science background, um, you know, you're like, well, how do I even cut through this and find this information? But there are a lot of people out there who are actually working to make this information more easily accessible. Um, and so I can definitely share some resources. Uh, I know David has a lot of these things in his class, and I, I'm sure uh, other people do as well that are accessible to people who don't have a computer science background, but that can help them to teach and think about and to share with their students. Great, thank you so much. And, and thank you everyone for keeping the questions coming. Um, a lot of interesting thoughts here. Um, Reva says, I'm interested to hear from the panelists on what is actually being automated today in their discipline. One reads about shiny things in the media, but I'm more interested in 
what is actually happening versus cute prototypes? That's question one. So let's start there. I mean, I guess I'll start with accounting. That's that's kind of my the, the area in which I have the most knowledge of how AI is being used. Um, I think first of all, there's a there's um, there's AI, there's cognitive technologies, there's ro robotic process automation, and there's machine learning. And the experts on this panel can identify them better than I can, but it's my understanding. My understanding is they're very different things. So it kind of depends on who you talk to. A lot of people in um, the profession, an accounting profession, like to lump it all as AI, but it's not necessarily AI. That being said, um, you see large um, auditing uh, accounting firms using it in audit, particularly using AI to help identify risk. Um, and so, um, you know, able to kind of give the, the the technology, the background of the company, and have the AI identify the risk areas. That being said, um, you still need the accounting professionals, right, to determine whether or not those are accurate. Uh, so we definitely see it in that. We see it, um, I would say probably right now, more what I would refer to as cognitive technology. So in other words, you kind of build into it. Um, it, it helps with decision making, but again, they're kind of like standard decision making. So if this happens, do that. If this happens, do that um, type of thing. But we also do see it being used, AI and being used in analyzing, um, for example, leases, right? Um, there's different ways that you have to account for leases and AI is being used to be able to, instead of a person having to read the lease, right? You're putting it through um, artificial intelligence for that to do the analysis. Those are just a few examples. Oh, I'll go next then, I guess. Um, so in the field of communication, we see it all over the place. Um, already, we are replacing film and book critics with recommendation algorithms and music critics with recommendation algorithms. Most of us now choose our media content, not based on reading a review, but based on a recommendation we get through one of the streaming services, and that's all AI generated. Uh, script writing in both television and film. A lot of script is partially written by AI. Um, we see it with uh, the replacement of focus groups. We can feed a script into an AI that will evaluate the script and calculate what the box office receipts will be if the film is made. And they actually use this to decide which films get made and which films don't get made in terms of our entertainment. Uh, with the interpersonal communication, we see it on the customer relations side in which we are now chatting all the time with chatbots and we are not actually talking to human beings in call centers and we're replacing all the call center uh, personnel with uh, chatbot facilities. Uh, the generation of new music, a lot of music is uh, being now e either co-written or in some cases entirely written by um, artificial intelligence. And there are a number of algorithms that help on both the composition side, but also on the production side. And visual imaging with Dolly, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, all now providing uh, original imaging that can be utilized for visual communication uh, that is replacing the role of human artists in a lot of um, online publications. So it is really exploding um, in the field of communication and information. Uh, we have a second question, it, it, and certainly jump in. If, Maya, you do, do you have a something to talk about? Oh, it's just like a simple, simple comments, like for computer science, like AI is everywhere, like. It is everything, like, right? <laughs> yeah, like all the tools, so like a tech company tools, most of them embed AI as background. And, and, and even for the, like, a, like a learning process, I think AI kind of like, I mean, the most common, like, mechanism is just a recommendation. Like a whole bunch of online materials, learning stuff, they always recommend, like, you, you just go here from there. And and also like computer science, a whole bunch of things you have to touch the AI because like we are working on that thing, we're creating those stuff. So like the student have to like understand the technical details and to work on that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe you can address uh, we have a second part of uh, or second question. One of the things I've been I've seen in my field is that earlier tools haven't gotten rid of programmers. They're just enabling existing programmers to do more. 
uh, Microsoft Word both. It got rid of a lot of clerical help and it also raised the standards for what the rest of us need to do to produce pa uh, paper. Have you, have you seen more of that kind of um, doubling maybe of um, different tools maybe addressing different needs? Yeah, I'll add. Um, so in journalism, that's more of what we're seeing. So in the journalism process, um, there are multiple parts that are being increasingly automated. And I, I do want to bring up a good point because I think this is also what Reva or bring up a point that I think what Reva was talking about or trying to get to is um, how much of this is marketing? Because we, we hear a lot of hyperbole in the press, um, including about their own use of these technologies. Uh, but then uh, also, you know, are these things, quote unquote, really AI? Within journalism, um, there's this, uh, Nick Diakopoulos is, is a great researcher, and he talks about like, if you squint hard enough, it could be AI, and that some processes are artificial intelligence, some are machine learning, and some, though, are more just more simplistic automation, but because they come in and stand in for a human in some way, they get thrown into the AI camp. Um, and so that might be something that people want to look out for in, in their disciplines or in these workspaces. Uh, not necessarily is it is it or is it not AI, which is important, but also to think about like more just automation that may occur through things like algorithms, but doesn't quite get into the AI camp. Um, but in journalism right now, we're seeing more of the augmentation, um, kind of what Reva was getting at with, you know, MS Word got rid of clerical staff, um, but it, you know, did all these other things where we're seeing it being integrated into processes that can help um, and and can bolster productivity. Um, and it, in journalism, it's, it's not just content creation where we talk about, yes, there's technologies that write. For example, there's social media listening technologies that alert journalists to trends on Twitter um, or to trends on social media about something that's happening. Um, we use machine learning in investigative uh, reporting, which is extremely helpful because there are some things that we study that investigative journalists look at the amount of paperwork they have to go through, like the Panama Papers, which was a big global investigation, could not have happened without AI. Um, and then, you know, in, in distribution. So it's opening up new avenues for sure. Um, one of the questions, though, becomes, you know, we, we talked about is AI going to do this? Is AI, is machine learning going to do this? I, it's important to keep in mind there's a difference between the technologies and the people who make decisions in business. And so in journalism, for example, um, we could possibly say, well, these technologies aren't great, but they work good enough. And if you're a media company that is owned um, by investors looking for a return on investment, they may say, well, that's good enough then, and we'll, we'll get rid of people. So these are the types of things we're seeing now, um, but it's not just a question of the technology. It's also a question of the economic systems um, and, and larger decisions by higher ups. And those are the harder things for us to forecast, to tell our students about, um, you know, what sort of decisions will uh, people who are far removed from their positions make in the future, so. Yeah, that, um, you know, I'm I'm learning so much from all of you. Thank you so much. And, you know, it, it's really sticking in my head that, you know, even the title looking ahead, um, you know, the, the future is now, I guess. <laughs> and so how do, how do we look ahead? And we you know, it, it sounds like it's, it's still a little bit murky and it can be, you know, difficult to know, um, especially in probably anything technology rapidly changes and changes our world. Um, so did anyone else have any comments on uh, really that future? What do we see it, even a year from now?
I'll just say, given what we've uh, just experienced over the last week and a half with the release of GTP4 and then Google barred uh, just a few days ago, uh, I'm really hesitant to make any predictions very far out because the rapid rate at which these things are coming at us, um, I think has exceeded everyone's expectations. And uh, a year from now, uh, who knows where we'll be, but uh, certainly it will be more of the same um, as we you know, see these things advance and uh, even have other players enter the market. Yeah, that, that smile on your face when I said that was, <laughs> was all telling. <laughs> Um, I do want to get to the questions in the text chat. Um, I'm a language instructor. I do not have a computer science background. I don't want to develop oral exercises like Siri, where students have to have a conversation, uh, can have a conversation, um, open resources from text to speech or um, speech to text, but I do not know how to craft them together? Is there a template that can I can use? Um, so I guess maybe one of my um, clarifying questions here for this is, um, is text to speak, um, like what category of artificial intelligence would that fall under? Or does it? It seems like a, a tool. Yes, it is. It, it is a tool. Um, so like you can type a text and it, it, it turns into an audio and then audio go back to the text. I think David already answered my question. He has uh, some idea about that. And thank you, David. But maybe other panelists have an idea because I want to create it something like Siri to my students. I can see like uh, from text to audio, but I want to craft both of them into one complex. <laughs> I think it's like for the assessments like uh, or practice for my students and I see a couple of them and I try to read it but it seems very complicated and I wonder if there's some easy template that I can use. So I'll just follow up because I answered already in the in the chat but um, really what we're talking about are really two distinct kind of technologies that are very interrelated. There's the chatbot, which is the text-based thing that you do on your keyboard and then read the responses on your screen. And then there's the spoken dialogue system or digital assistant, like a Siri and Alexa, which just jams um, a speech-to-text recognizer on the front end and a text-to-speech uh, synthesis module on the back end. It is much easier to just deal with the chatbot in terms of engaging students in the technology because the other pieces of the chain of events are making things more complicated um, in the process of teaching this material. So I have my students build a chatbot using the Pandora bots ch uh, platform, which is what the Kuki um, uh, chatbot uses, which is a six time Lerbner prize winning chatbot. Um, but it's really fast, easy. It's taking very little um, programming knowledge on the student side. And it's more about scripting responses and developing a chatbot that you uh, build a personality for and then you can share it with each other and we run a sort of quasi Lerner prize competition in class where we talk to each other's chatbots and try to see which one is the best performing chatbot but there's a lot you can do with the available tools that are already uh, free to us um, through various vendors uh, without having to get really too complicated and involved in much more of the technological um, components that um, you know you might want to have in play so if you're if you can deal with a chat bot, I, I can show you Pandora bots and, and get you started with that. Um, if you really want to build a Siri or an Alexa, um, that's going to be a little more of a undertaking because you have to worry about the two, uh, the input and the output modules that uh, feed into the chat bot uh, algorithm. Thank, thank you for that um, really clarification and other information. There's so many, uh, tools and resources that you're throwing out there. It's just, it's just mind boggling, it really is. Um, so uh, another question we have in the uh, chat area, uh, which chat area now seems so different to me. Um, recent AI art generator episode, images of Trump being arrested scared a lot of people regarding potential disruption, um, power of AI in politics, do you see a regulatory mechanism catching up soon? Should there be a regulatory um, scheme for these? 
so I just have to laugh here and then I'm going to send it to David because this is David's area of expertise, but like we haven't caught up on the internet. So, <laughs> <laughs> or social media. Um, and I mean, if you want to think researchers are flat footed on this politician, it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I just want to, uh, from the journalist perspective, this is extremely disconcerting. Um, it's been going on for a while, but that is actually the number one concern among journalists is not necessarily whether or not AI is going to take their jobs. Um, because again, we've had a little bit longer to get used to this. I mean, ChatGPT is different, but it's AI has been around in journalism now for 10 years. So we've had a little bit more time to kind of get used to that concept. But this is actually the bigger concern is, is how can automated technologies, because one thing they also do is... Um, make it easier for people to create content. And that can be extremely helpful, um, but it can also ramp up this disinformation um, and misinformation in environment. Um, and I know David's been working on the regulatory stuff, but yeah. So I've been involved with a number of meetings of the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center in Washington, DC, which is a uh, joint uh, congressional policy think tank and there is desire, I think, on the side of regulators to do something, but there hasn't been a lot of practical traction with getting anything through either the Senate or uh, the House with regards to um, any kind of new regulation for AI. The Biden administration put out the roadmap not too long ago, but that really is about protecting innovation and industry and less about protecting consumers and uh, various uh vulnerable populations um, as we roll these things out. The EU is far ahead, um, obviously, because their legal system is much more statutory organized than ours is. And so they have been sort of the leaders in developing uh, a regulatory framework and some initiatives. But even there, uh, the they lag behind the innovation and the technology, and they recognize that keeping up with these changes is a real task in itself. Um, a colleague of mine has said that technology moves at light speed and law and policy move at pen and paper speed. And that's what we're trying to ne negotiate here. And that's the complication uh, that every government is looking at. And because these things are done nationally by different national governments, every part of the world is going to have a different version of AI policy. And then reconciling these across the international boundaries is going to be a second initiative that's going to have to take place uh, through some sort of UN or some other international cooperation. Okay, thank you. Um, kind of just paging through the the text chat here, and I guess that um, as we kind of get to the end of our time today, uh, this is a question that I had um, as well, and it really is about um, privacy. What should we be talking to our students about as far as uh, privacy when they're creating these Chat GPT accounts? Um, they're they're using Google, they're, you know, there's algorithms tracing their search histories. Um, again, what should we be telling our students about their privacy? Okay, I'm laughing because I do a terms of service uh, exercise with my students. And I ask them to read the terms of service for their favorite social media platform. And they come back horrified as a result of actually having read that thing that they never read and they just click agree on, right? So I think one of the places to get students really focused on the privacy concerns is to actually invite them and help them to read the terms of service. Because once you read the terms of service from OpenAI, um, you get to see exactly what data they're scraping in the process of creating your user profile. And if you just click agree because you want to use the tool and don't pause to think about the privacy implications of signing up for one of these beta tests or one of these widely available services, I think we're missing an opportunity to engage students in a conversation about platforms, platform capitalism, and privacy. Anyone else have any thoughts about privacy? So I think like the thing is a bit tricky, like a lot of a lot of tools, like if you as a user or the student as a user want to use it, they kind of like a force them to click the agree button. 
unless they create like click that button, there's no way for them to, like to proceed to start testing the functionality. So like it, it, I think it's a bit tricky thing. Like we can we do can like kind of like brings all the like a like privacy issues to the students and let them know all the stuff like they possibly use the things will be collected from you. But again, like the decision still has to be left for the individual who would choose to use it or not. Like I, I know this is like a pretty like a tricky things, like almost all the apps like people use today has to go through that. And I would imagine 99% of the users just simply click like a sure go ahead. Yeah. And I think this issue of, of privacy, right? So, uh, um, and everyone's like, I wanna take David's class. Yes, and I'm a former student for most people don't know that I'm actually an NIU grad and I had a class with, with several classes with David. So yes, take David's, <laughs> if we all could just have a class, maybe we, David needs to teach a master class here. Um, but to also to Mian's point, the fact that, you know, you know, you either agree or you don't to use these technologies. And those are some things, you know, when we're teaching about these technologies also to be reflective of um, is, you know, what technologies are we adopting to teach about AI? Um, are we, anytime I talk about technologies in my class, I, you know, try and clarify, you know, these are the technologies we're using. This is what they mean for privacy. Um, but I also want to bring out another point here, and this actually comes out of my work uh, with industry. And a lot of people are quote unquote playing around with chat GPT and putting things into it. And there's a really big debate right now in industry about um, proprietary information. And I also want to bring this to people's attention as researchers. So I know sometimes researchers, you know, or we're playing around with the technology, like I have this really long paragraph I want to turn into an abstract. I'm going to throw it into ChatGPT, see if it can do it. ChatGPT, you know, if, if, if you look at the, AI, the privacy, right, you're, you're turning that information over. Right now, OpenAI says it's not using that information to then form new responses, but there is this concern. Um, for example, Boeing, I know for a fact, has completely blocked out OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, because it's a defense contractor. Um, and so there's, there's these other, these much larger questions here around uh, privacy, when it has to do with proprietary information, uh, sensitive information. And again, this is not necessarily the way ChatGPT is working now, but if we think about other applications um, and the way they may they may function in the future and the way that you know they, they grow and uh, gain knowledge, this is, I mean, we could spend an entire hour talking about this. I, I know. <laughs> I feel like there's there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, but as we do sort of sort of wrap up, does any of the other panelists have any um, final thoughts? What what very important key takeaway um, did maybe we sort of miss in this conversation that you would like to share with the audience? Do we cover everything? <laughs> I'll, I'll make one quick comment in thinking about just what David and, and Andrea were saying. Um, one of the things that I have done in my class, because you know, you always want to think about ways to bring ethics, right, discussion into your class. And these discussions about these privacy policies and signing away, you know, kind of all of your information. Um, I have in my AI in my county information systems class had students do debates on that, right? Because it's a trade-off between convenience of using the website or the app and privacy concerns. And so it's um, it's made for some really rich, um, you know, discussion among the students to kind of set that up um, as a debate. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there since as that might be a really good um, way to engage your students in this conversation. Yeah, I'm definitely taking notes on these, you know, really important assignments that I think are, um, is, a, is a really positive way 
to to use these tools and have these conversations. And so uh, I do want to, you know, just kind of keep our ears open um, as we kind of wrap up the session. Um, but I also want to make sure that I put in some time to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, really engaging, really interesting um, conversations and so much more to un unpack. So thank you so much for your, your time and your expertise. Um, I'm, yes, there's there's lots of thank yous in the um, in the chat area and um, thank you again so much for just being part of this and spending some time with us on a Friday morning, um, the, the week after spring break. So in, in many cases, the week that we just ramped up for the second half of the semester. Um, and thank you all participants for joining us um, and, and being so engaged in, in the conversation. Will this recording be made available or transcript? Some people are asking. Yes, yes, thank you um, for pointing that out to me. But yes, the recording will be um, transcribed and um, available to everyone that that at least attended. It may also go on our website. But I, I'm going to stop the recording now. So if anybody has any uh, maybe sensitive uh, questions, 